Okay, for our main presentation this evening, we're going to have Bill Ragsdale, K6KN, and he's going to talk about fox hunting, radio direction finding. So let's give a big hand to our guest, Bill Ragsdale. So, mic on? Yeah. Good sound in the back? Yep. Very good. Delightful to be here. Uh, I have about five favorite topics, and tea hunting is one of the favorites. So, how many here have done tea hunting, been out on a hunt before? Oh, good, good. We've got about six. So that's pretty good. Well, it's called bunny hunting, fox hunting, tea hunting, someplace I was at, and, and I called it uh, fox hunting, and they said, well, you have trouble with the animal rights people. And I said, no, that's radio, it's radio. We don't kill the fox, we just find the transmitter. So, they take the transmitters put out in the booty somewhere, and your job is to track it down. It's useful for, for many applications, which I'll see in just a moment. The methods that we use, uh, one is signal strength only. That's very impractical. The second one is directional antenna. That helps. Uh, the next one is, is uh, uh, dual antenna nulling. It's a little bit complicated side, but it gives you a very, very precise uh, direction. And then finally, the multiple antenna base detection called Doppler. Uh, that's uh, like shoot fish in a barrel because you put it on your car, there's a, a series of LEDs, and you just drive to where the dot is on the LEDs, and it takes you right to the location. So the hunt types. The first is local, which is on foot. Typically it might be six, ten blocks, a mile, something like that. Uh, we will run one from one city park to another city park. Another one is wide area, which is by automobile. And in that case, the sky's the limit. I've done fox hunting from, um, they did about, about a hundred mile range. We started in Altamont Pass, and the bunny was somewhere in the foothills. And uh, Wayne never came close. You know, those are the high pros. And then there's contest, uh, which is orienteering style, heavily in Europe and a little bit in the United States. In that case, it's very competitive. There's a set up course, there's all kinds of rules. International competitors come in. They hide five transmitters, usually in a forested situation. The transmitters are on a one minute cycle. So each transmitter will transmit for about 10 seconds. And, and they cover the entire sequence in one minute. Each broadcast in Morse code, it's number one, two, three, four, five. So you can tell easily which transmitter it is by counting the dots. It's, uh, the goal is to find all the five transmitters in the least possible time. So it's a mix both of finding them and estimating how far away, and you get the close ones first, the far ones first, and trying to figure the path that you would use to go between those five. It's mostly on two meters, but, if, but they also do a lot on 80 meters, again, in Europe. So there's a quick review on the setup. The, uh, on, on doing an event, this is more for your club organization if you decide to do one. Uh, you set up a time, date, place, way in advance, an event schedule, what time of day, what's going to happen when. Then you promote it. Promote like mad, call up all the other clubs or send an email out or uh, you know, announcements to all the other clubs. You get your equipment lined up, and then participants can use either limited equipment or come in pairs. A lot of times with enough lead time, they will be able to get the proper equipment, which uh, vendors are on the sheet that I've passed out. And oh, a very key part of this is people are monitoring a given repeater so that uh, once, the, once the event is over, you can announce on a repeater, oh, by the way, we're all finished. So the people are still hunting can all come in. And then very important, you have a social event afterward. But here are the techniques and some of the irritations. The first is on two meters is, is uh, multi-path and reflections. If you're in an industrial area, it's particularly a problem because you've got metal buildings. And in a park that's wooded, it probably won't be too bad at all. Uh, in that case, to to try to get another, what you'll find out, of course, is your direction <coughs> reading will change. So move sideways, try to find something that's consistent where you get the reading several times in the same direction. And if it needs to be, go like a block away, and you would, you know, you would hopefully get out of an area where there might be reflection. Uh, we'll see a little bit later on triangulation. 
One way would be take a reading and then, by estimate, go many blocks at a 45 degree angle. Go to the side. Don't go straight toward the bunny. Go at a 45 degree angle to the side. Take another reading. And now you've got another angle. And then where the two lines meet, you hope that's where the bunny is. We'll see a map later on. Uh, also, get up in the air if you can. Get altitude. If you're doing a, a hunt on foot, you don't have much choice about to get altitude. And I don't really mean to get it. Well, if you get a tall building, that would help. Uh, where altitude works is on the wide area. On a wide area hunt, one we did from Alamont Pass, we all heard the bunny because we were up at uh, like 1,000 feet. When we get down on the ground, you've lost a signal. So the only way to get the signal is to find a highway overcrossing and drive up on the overcrossing and then take another reading. So uh, as you can tell, I'm not a, fond, a fan of the wide area uh, events. The second issue is signal level. The signal level range from distant to on top of the bunny is, is somewhere in the range of 80 dB. Well, that's 100 <coughs> million times signal strength. Every, D, every 10 dB is 10 times. So 8 dB makes uh, 8 zeros, and so that's 100 million times signal strength variation. So you use a directional antenna, that will solve some of it. And the key thing, the key, key thing is an attenuator so that you can, re, you can reduce the signal strength into your uh, receiver HT in proportion to the distance that you have to the bunny. One technique that they mention, and Pacificon talks about this, and, and it really, you know, is, is kind of a, of a loser activity, and that is using body fade. You can take an HT and use your body as to affect directionality. So you put the receiver in front of you, turn around until you have minimum signal, and then the bunny's in the opposite direction. Uh, it, you know, it kind of works. Other techniques are uh, the ever popular. Uh, uh, what's what the potato chips come in the can? Pringles. 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 Pringles has metal foil liner on that, so you can punch a hole in the bottom, put your antenna up into it, and it becomes a shielded antenna that's sensitive kind of in one direction. So that can be used uh, when you get real close using you know these these kind of. Uh, uh, compromise ways. When you get real close, you can drop down to a short antenna. Here's a piece of coax that has one inch unshielded. So put this in place of your antenna. And where you're in the last few hundred feet, then you have enough antenna that just this little one inch um, will, will help you. But we'll skip, skip over that. The real way, of course, is with an attenuator. So the item that you need is a VHF transceiver, an attenuator, an attenuator, a directional antenna, and then if you're on an event, you need a second HD to monitor uh, the event control. And we'll show you examples of these, of these hardware items. Like I said, the no attenuator, me uh, no attenuator method is really not all that practical. So the equipment. On a close-in walking event, you don't need a map. Uh, if you are doing the wide area, you'll be taking readings and drive, readings and drive, you need to have a map. I'll show you these items on the such screen. We see antenna, okay, the ID in this case, and this one is made out of a measuring tape. See the yellow tape with the ruling on it. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, measuring tape antenna. Here's the antenna of the uh, attenuator. Got a knob on a box, input output, and its job is to give you that hundred million times attenuation of your signal strength. You know, you, when you're far away, you put the attenuation in. When, you get, uh, when you're far away, you have no attenuation. When you get close, then you put the attenuation in. And finally, a receiver, in this case, an HD. So there are several antenna types that you'll see in use. Uh, the Yagi, which uh, we'll show in just a moment, either a fixed element or the tape measure homemade type. The Doppler is used as four antennas that go rooftop on your car. The interferometer has two antennas, vertical antennas, usually put on a tripod with a precision compass, because the interferometer will give you a reading within one or two degrees. Very, very precise. But the setup and takedown 
and it takes like 10, 15 minutes. So it's, it's really not practical to use during a hunt, but it's very good to get that initial fix. They have a fox hunt every month down starting in the Fremont area. They start at the same position at a park every year up on Hilltop, and a guy starts putting an interferometer up and showing that, and he'll, he'll say, okay, what do you got? He'll say, I got 182 degrees. And so everybody knows, well, okay, we're gonna start off in that direction. Finally, uh, on 80 meters, they use a little, little mini receiver and a, a loop antenna that's about eight inches in diameter, okay? Again, it's uh, set up to be very directional. 80 meters is nice because there's no multi-path. So in many ways, for novices, the 80 meter is actually better. But again, it takes a specialized receiver and the antenna. Um, it's also quite compact. So something in the range of about, about 18 inches tall. And again, in the US, I don't, I don't know anybody, you know, everybody's VHF that I'm aware of in the, in the greater Northern California area. So the antenna, this one is very, very popular. Plans exist online. In the handout I passed out, there's a website uh, for it made out of measuring tape, uh, PVC pipe. The nice part about it is when you put it in your car, you can just fold the blades up and they'll put a little loop in the middle and you fold it the blades inwards and so the thing folds down to be about 10 inches wide and about uh, two and a half feet long. And if you're going through bushes or bump into somebody, the, leads, the uh, blades are flexible. This is a peak of what's inside the active attenuator. We'll talk about it technically in a moment. The uh, U1 on here on the left is, a, uh, is the 5 volt regulator. And then the little X1 is a 4 megahertz oscillator. So it's a little chip, uh, crystal controlled, right on 4 megahertz. At the top of the drawing is the diode D1. Oh, the bottom. Okay. So here's the RF generator. There's a diode here, and that uh, four megahertz signal is mixed in with DC into that diode. And as we know, diodes are a nonlinear device. They also vary their impedance based on the current. So the variable resistor here injects a very uh, variable amount of direct current and the four megahertz, and it will then generate a uh, harmonic four megahertz up, four megahertz down. But that amplitude, the amplitude of that uh, heterodyne signal is adjustable by the variable resistor. So if the Fox carrier is here at 144.80 and you have no attenuator in and you listen at 148.80, you will hear nothing. But once the attenuator starts to inject its 4 megahertz signal at this 4 megahertz offset, you will begin to hear and and receive uh, an image or a copy of that uh, Fox signal. Is that clear? Any questions on that? Okay. It's just like the way the, the uh, IF stages in your transceiver work. Instead of heterodyning down, well, there's actually heterodynes up and down. Well, they all do. So you don't really need an S meter, so all you're doing is playing the detector. Um, that comes next. Okay, the main thing is to get this down into a range that doesn't overload the front end of your uh, handy talking. And in fact, um, you, you normally work the handy talking right at the noise level. So what you do is you cut the input signal down, the, the, box, the Fox signal, you attenuate it down to where it's right at the noise level. The squelch is open, it's at the noise level, and now what you're hearing is you're using the noise level as a reference. As the buddy signal goes above the noise level, you're closer. As it goes below the noise level, you're further away. Here's a, here's a beautiful rig. It comes out of Australia. It's called the Mark IV. I got a, one of them here. It's, it's, about, it's about $180 including freight. I think it's about $160 and then the transportation is $71. And uh, it is intended specifically for fox hunting. It's a wide dynamic receiver, and it automatically steps down. So when, when the signal level hits a certain threshold, it will automatically step down by 15 dB. So as you get closer, it'll go down, and, and also it converts the RF signal into a tone. So you're not listening to amplitude, you're listening to frequency. So it will go like that. 
every time it drops, you, you are now 15 dB more attenuation as you approach the bunny. It has in it about seven or eight operating modes. Uh, there's a bunny hunt contest in Australia every year, and there's a one button setting here just for that, that mode that's set in Australia. There's a Boy Scout mode. You know, mode number seven is for Boy Scouts. And it basically disables everything except like the on-off button. So that way when it's turned on, it's operating. And when you turn it off, it's off. And there are no other control buttons that work. So this is for a naive user, somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing. And again, this is very uh, popular at youth events, Boy Scout events. There's a summary on it. It's, it's, uh, dynamic, it's got a very wide dynamic range. Uh, uh, plus 30 dB is one watt down to minus 120, which is uh, you know, a very, very good transceiver is minus 120. It does the 120 to 123 megahertz because that is used for animal tracking. Uh, these are also used worldwide for the collaring of animals. So you've got one of these about the mounts and you go down and chase a bear, find a cougar, find, find, find somebody in their den. <laughs> anyway, and then the other ones are ham frequencies. And again, quite compact. This is the Ford Doppler, this is a Doppler system. The Doppler system goes on the roof of your car. And it, um, it receives the signals through four antennas and compares the phase or time of arrival of those signals. And this goes through a processor that's in the box, okay, down here in the, in the box. And it isn't illuminated, but on the front of this box are about uh, 36 LEDs in a circle. And so as you drive, you'll get one or two LEDs light up and that's the direction of the bunny. Now, if the, belt, if the, if the lights are at 3 o'clock, that means then it is to the right of you. So then you hit the next intersection, turn right, and hopefully the little dots go ding, 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 right up to, to the 12 o'clock, which means you're driving toward it. This is what all the hotshots use in, in Fremont. I was out there with my wife, and we're walking around, you know, with, uh, with this rig, turning knobs with maps, drive, get out of the car, Take a reading, get in the car, drive. Then I left the antenna on the car, I drove away, and then I saw the antenna bouncing down the street as I was behind me. So that's what we're doing. The guys that have the top of the radar, they just drive to find the bunny, they log it, and then go to McDonald's and they have a cup of coffee and wait for everybody else. So, okay. With wide area, uh, in this case, uh, you uh, if you aren't using Doppler, you, you've got to have a map and a compass and colored pen, straight line, then your regular uh, attenuator, Yagi antenna. So it is handled in about this way. In this case, you use the same directional antenna and attenuator, but on the antenna base, you've got an you, uh, you've got a, 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 a orienteering type uh, compass, a compass with a rotating dial. Uh, North seeking pointer, so on. A good, a good compass. Good meaning like eighteen dollars, something like that. Also, you need a map, and on the map you need to put magnetic lines on the map because the pointer of the compass is going to be magnetic directions, and the maps that you will take off the internet will be using true north. So you have to then figure out, you know, not figure out, but you use the normal process to put magnetic north lines on your compass. So here is one that we actually did. This is real life. We started at the Red Cross building in Woodland, which is fix number one. And we had uh, uh, about three people there that were hunting. And so we took the first fix and we got this angle, which on the magnetic line was essentially magnetic north. And at that point, we could have walked, but of course we're not on city streets, so we can't walk through those buildings. We've got to walk on city streets anyway. So we did fix number one, Red Cross, pointed north. A couple of days we had to walk through four or five blocks of buildings, which we didn't do. So we turned right and we went down West Street and we got to the high school, which was convenient. And again, it hit about 45 degrees. Took another fix, we got the blue line fix. Now, since we're in a nice setting and the bunny is in a park, uh, there were no reflections. And so we got very good readings. And the bunny was at the, uh, see where the, where the um, green dot was. So the first fix driving us north missed by five degrees, and then the second fix, number two, got us right straight on the bunny. So we just didn't walk right to it, 
And then once you get into the park, we knew roughly, you know, it's kind of in the middle, and we roughly knew the angle. So you walk up to it, and if you're doing this in a public event, you then get very discreet, and you pretend you don't see it. So you walk around, and you know, you're like this. And then you, you go, oh, yeah. And then you keep looking, ooh, and so you, you, you pretend you don't see it, and then keep walking, because you, in the park there will be usually five other people hunting for the same transmitter, and you don't want to give them a clue where you actually saw it. Uh, typically it would be placed in something like a, uh, a camouflage can. One they used a Pacificon was actually literally in a stuffed bird. It was a little stuffed bird, and the bird was in the tree. And you would look up and you'd see the little bird there, and then pretty soon you realize it's a stuffed bird. <laughs> it's kind of like geocaching where you, you know, you, you don't tip the people around you, you know, what's actually hidden. Here's a real life example. Uh, this was down in Fremont. Uh, the number one line was off the mountaintop down here. And then we drove a long way and we got this one over here, I believe, and got a fix down here. And then I got this number four, which was terrible. The number four was totally wrong. It was pointing down to Santa Clara. So I had two that were correct, and then one, for whatever reason, totally wrong into Santa Clara. And then finally we took the, the, another reading and they crossed and we got reasonably close. Um, uh, but as I say, the white, the, this is the, not, you know, there's a, there's a, a proportion you can use. The walking, hunt, the walking hunts are like under a mile. Uh, the local ones would be like one to ten, five miles, you know, with it around the city. And then the white area ones, and I would kind of call this white area because we're, this is off the mountaintop in Fremont, and the bunny was maybe uh, 10 miles away. Uh, it's kind of mystical because you realize you're on the mountaintop, and you can hear a transmitter that's nine miles away that's tucked around some fence post or some signpost or someplace out there, out of everything in the whole Bay Area, you know, there's all kinds of RF, there's all kinds of noise, there's all kinds of signals, every TV transmitter, every channel in use, and you're hearing that one little beep beep that's coming off of that little distant transmitter. So, why have a tea hunt? Well, one of them is it's good practice against a repeater jammer. Uh, in case when you have a repeater jammer, you will very often be using tea hunt techniques one at a time. One guy will set up and he'll have his gear set up and when the, when the uh, jammer comes along they'll tune down the jammer's frequency, the repeater input frequency, and they get, get a reading. Then they pass the equipment to somebody else. Maybe four days later somebody else hears the jammer, takes a reading, and right up, so I've seen people doing this, it takes maybe eight to ten events before you actually can home in on where the person is uh, who it is. Finally, uh, another one is you learn the practical aspects of RF. Uh, this, this thing about reflections and signal levels, you know, uh, amplitude, hydrodyne, and so on. So you pick up a, you know, an interesting piece of, of theory on that. You learn new aspects of your HT, for example, setting off frequency by 4 megahertz. And I, coming set up tonight here, I almost forgot you turn the squelch off on your HT because you want to hear any signal at any level. And all of a sudden, I was having a little trouble practicing at home, and I realized, now I got the squelch on the receiver. And so then, I had to go get the book to read how to turn the squelch off. So, uh, again, awkward if you're doing this in the field in the, in, in the middle of the night, you know, and again. And finally, um, it's great to have a social event afterward where you discuss who did what, and who had a hard time, and who found it, and who didn't. That, con that concludes my formal remarks. I will now do a, a hold up and talk and point uh, on this. And after the event, um, or the, you know, in 10 or 15 minutes, we can set up the uh, uh, transmitter. This, uh, this is uh, Bionic out of Las Vegas is, in my way of thinking, the premier supplier on the list. They make, they make um, uh, in a wide variety, some very technical units. This is a transmitter and receiver. This is a, as a two meter transceiver. And so you can do the setup on it by RF using touch tone. Or you can plug your computer in and you've set a huge variety. The typical way would be if you're gonna start the, the hunt at nine o'clock in the morning, 
you program nine o'clock startup, set the clock on this, put it out in a hidden place, and it doesn't start transmitting until nine o'clock. Because otherwise, you get people who are jumping the gun, and they come along at eight thirty, and they want to get a head start. Um, it, it uh, of course, it identifies itself every ten minutes. It has a variety of signals it can use. It can put in tones. It can put in music. It can put steady carrier. Um, you can set the repetition rate. This comes on, I believe, about once every 20 seconds, and it transmits for about five seconds every 20, 30 seconds. And uh, those those values are uh, completely adjustable. I guess, uh, it, it's a it's a, it's around 150 dollars, I believe, by memory, something like that. Here's a smaller transmitter, transmit only. It is programmable, so you have to plug a, a USB connector in. And so all of the uh, things like the start time and the clock and the rest are all programmable, but not by RF. Uh, this has, I believe, about 80 or 90 milliwatts, and this one is around uh, 100 milliwatts, something like that. Uh, there never seems to be a problem with, with too much signal. And the lower signal is, is fine, and your batteries last longer. Okay. Here's a complete fox hunting rig set up. The antenna is in your literature that I passed, that was passed out, which is by, I think it's Elk in some place like Montana. It's, it's the Arrow 2 uh, antenna system. It's UHF and VHF. I only have the UH and VHF elements in here. It also has VHF elements, and in the hand there's a diplexer. So you can use this for satellite use. It's really good to talk to Earth satellites. Uh, talk through Earth cell and repeaters, and I've worked the space station a couple of times with this, 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 this handheld. Is it periodic? Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, so it's only three on one Yagi. Yeah. Okay, not enough space for periodic. I guess periodic is just more elements on Yagi. Yeah. Uh, the antenna, the attenuator, the little box in the center here. In there is a little coin battery and uh, one chip. Uh, the board is available itself for something like $15. Uh, the entire assembly is thirty dollars. By all means, get the assembled version. Don't don't finish it yourself. Um, you would only get that assembly as if you're building into something larger. And then finally, this is a HT. It's just a Yaesu HT that uh, couples right in. I'll turn this on and uh, we'll see if uh, we can hear it. back to the room. because this is the best signal and it's actually there. I gotta wait for it to come around again. wide area that you were talking about that you've done. How many, uh, what's the output of your transmitter on uh, something like that? Um, I'm not certain. Um, I was a participant in that and it was an out, out outlander. I don't know the club, but I'm guessing it's probably five watts. Okay. You know, if you can do line of sight, five watts, uh, well, you know, I worked the space station with five watts of my HT. So you go 400 miles with the HT of five it. watts. That's a so I'm guessing it's five watts. It might, might be 20. Uh, and one fun way to do a wide area, uh, and this is done very commonly back east, is you put somebody in a car and they just talk it. So they get in their car, 
typically you camouflage the car, you hide it, you put it under tarps, you do something or other. And he just sits there and reads an article out of QST. You know, just read the article out of QST and ID every five minutes or ten minutes. And the people are out hunting for the guy. They drive all around and uh, he could be in a parking lot, you know, with other cars all around, or he could be out in the boondocks under a tree. But you just, you know, there's no reason you have to use a, um, uh, you know, a robot uh, transmitter. You can use somebody out there. Um, okay. Question? Yes. So like when you were doing in Fremont, you came off the mountaintop, but then how did you decide to pick point two? It was almost like you knew where the thing would be, or how did you figure that you out? You just moved to another location. You just... The guys with the Doppler, they just start driving off the hill, and then they just chase the little spot on their Doppler, always homing in on it. So what we did, though, is we drove off the hill, and then we drove kind of to the side, uh, like a couple of miles, and then stopped and took another reading. Okay. And then from there, we drove a couple other miles and stopped. And I pulled up by a, in Fremont, and by a municipal utilities water pumping district, and the security guard came out and asked us what we were doing. <laughs> no. likely, but you know, look like this was before 9-11 even. I don't know about today. Um, another thing too that's important is, is hide the transmitter and mark it, you know, put down on it. Uh, amateur radio, uh, science experiment, something like that. Otherwise, if somebody finds it and thinks it's a bomb, uh, I got my phone number and name on it. Uh, I was practicing in a city park across the street from my house, and I had this little, uh, this little low cost one. And so I put it up in the crotch of a tree as high as I could reach, up high, resting on it. And then I went to drive around town seeing what kind of range could I get from it, how, how far. And I, then I came back to it and either, I don't know, checked it or reset something or other. I didn't realize a couple of kids were across the street in a car and saw me. And so then I drove away and I went to go find the thing. And um, then I drive away and like I'm driving in a circle around blocks and all of a sudden the things moved. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, <laughs> did the things move? And so I pounded out around the corner, jam, 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 like that. And I saw these car driving away like that, driving away. And, I, and of course by now I'm in the car and I'm not tracking it live. You know, I don't I don't have that stuff out. And so I followed them around and um, and I, I only know the block away and know the streets, and they drove up a, a, a blind street. They drove a, a one-way blind street, and they hit the back of it like that, and so I blocked the street with my car. And here I am, Mr. Brave, you know, I'm 70, and these kids were like 19 years old, <laughs> two of them. And, but it turned out they were, they were you know, they were um, afraid too. They didn't know what they had and they didn't know who I was, and so, and so I cut them off, and then they, they said, we put it over there, it's over there, it's over there. And so, so I, okay, so they drove off. And so then I went about half a block away in the open spot on the side there, so it was laid on the street, so I got back. So, so you, you, um, you want to be discreet about this stuff. Any other questions, then we'll wrap up here, anyway. Um, if you want to have a club event, I could come and kind of proctor and mentor it, but you should get it. To make it fun, at least you should have at least three people that have antennas, attenuator, and an HT. You, 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 to make it fun, you need at least three participants. Yes? Yeah, I understand the mixing on the attenuator, but how does the attenuator work? I mean, how do you get the attenuation part of it? Um, a, okay, a diode is nonlinear. Yeah, I got, diode, okay. I got that. With no current through a diode linear, it's an open circuit. It has infinite resistance. Okay. Okay, if you put um, three or four hundred, three, I mean, put like 20 million <coughs> through a diode, all of a sudden now that diode curve, it, it, it's at like maybe say 20, 30 ohms. So going up the knee of a, of a diode, you go from, from <coughs> infinity to 20 ohms by setting the DC current. And so that potentiometer that's in there, that pot, just cranks more and less resistance into the diode, which gives it more or less impedance. All right, and that's basic and, 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 and it's coupling. Let's go go back to that. So the antennas coming in here, where my finger is, the red dot, goes through a blocking capacitor through the diode, and then it goes through a blocking capacitor to your receiver. The pot 
starts here at 9 volts, goes through a resistor, goes through here, DC goes through the diode, DC comes out of the diode, goes back down the ground. So there's a variable level of DC going through the diode. Mixed with the DC is 4 megahertz. So there's two things. There's, there's DC and there's 4 megahertz. So as the more current goes through the diode, its impedance drops, which means it couples from input to output. With no current through the diode, it's essentially open circuit. There, there might be a little bit of capacitance through the diode, but yeah, there's no coupling from input to output until you put a little DC on it. Did right. I cover it? Yeah, yeah, I got to thinking about a modulator I made back in college. <laughs> it is really simple. Really simple. Yeah, you use it as like a pin diode. No, it's no. like a that's a it's like a one end uh, 148, well, yeah, it's like a, you know, like a it's like a four yeah, cent diode. No, it's a silicon diode. For general purpose, right. a four cent yeah. silicon yeah. diode. Yeah. Um, but you're using like a variable switch. The yeah. oscillator, they use a four megahertz oscillator, and I don't know where it comes from, but it's a kind of a little chip and a half or something or other. They used to use a color burst generator on TV sets. There's something like it's in the 3.8 megahertz color burst frequency somewhere in there. They used to use that oscillator because it's commercially available out of color TV, but it's too hard to figure because you've got to then take your carrier frequency add the funny frequency. So in this case, four megahertz is a round number. Another thing they do also is, if you have too much signal, go to the third harmonic. Go to the third harmonic of the body. Because right away there, you're going to have uh, 40, 50 dB of attenuation. So thank you for the use of the hall. All I ask is, yes? Quick question. Is anybody using SDR radio and be able to manipulate the signal uh, just in like a raspberry or something? No, SDR would not work. I'm s s just saying that, and I don't know for sure, but it wouldn't work. Um, just receiving. The RF signal level is what matters. And with SDR, you're digitizing that signal. And if, you, if your signal gets below threshold, the digitization fails. And so you, you, you don't get output. What you, what you really want, this is analog, and what you really want then is um, the analog level of the RF transmitter, okay, of the RF, and and the SDR is the end of it's, it's it's compensating for signal loss by digitizing. Is that is that good enough answer? So I would not spend time with SDR. Besides, you want it on an HT, and I don't know SDR and HTs right now. Okay. Any other questions? Good. Thanks for the use of the hall.